It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Jack Graham, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, Reignite, Fresh Focus for an Enduring Faith. Jack, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Looking forward to uh, our conversation. Now, I actually had the pleasure of doing PR for a couple of Jack's earlier books at Bethany House, but this is the first time that we are connecting in person over Zoom today, so to speak. Uh, and so are. I know Jack is going to be new to some of you, so we're going to kick this off by having Jack share a little bit of the Jack Graham origin story for the person meeting you for the first time in our talk today. What are a few things they should know about you? Well, I should always start with the love of my life, my wife, Deb, and uh, we have uh, three children and eight grandchildren. Uh, grateful for our family. And uh, for the past 31 years, I've been pastor of Prestonwood Baptist Church uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, it is a fantastic church uh, with multiple locations, uh, but we're grateful to God for the uh, opportunity to serve here for now over three decades. And we've seen God do some incredible things. And uh, when I write, uh, it's really an extension of of the ministry here and the pulpit ministry in particular, and the things that uh, are are near and dear to my heart from from God's word. And our church is built on uh, the word of God, the testimony of Jesus. It is strongly evangelistic and mission hearted, and uh, a great church. We have ministries like our pregnancy center, saving babies every day. Over the last twenty five thirty years, we've seen over seventy three thousand babies born as a direct result of, of, of this ministry. Uh, we have a, a school where we're training the next generation, uh, grade school through uh, high school, uh, and on and on, uh, a sports ministry, reaching people using sports. So it's, a, it's an incredible church, and, and uh, your, your viewers and listeners could go to Prestonwood.org, Prestonwood.org, and watch our services live if they choose to get a taste of what Prestonwood is all about. But uh, that's my heart. I'm a pastor. Uh, you know, I write books uh, because it's another opportunity to uh, proclaim Christ and the gospel and the word of God. And so this is, um, this is my latest, and I'll forever call it my, uh, my COVID book. And uh, so because it came out uh, just as we are hopefully exiting this pandemic. Yeah, for anybody who works in the publishing space, there are a lot of COVID books that are hitting the market right now. And as we progress through 2021 and into 2022, uh, as people were locked down and at home, it was a very prolific time for so many of our leaders uh, and authors. Uh, and in a moment, Jack, I want to get kind of into uh, the story, the journey that maybe ignites the message for this book. But um, for you, you've written a lot of books, but given the topic of this one, was it harder than some of your earlier books? I feel like you, you share a lot of personal things in this uh, journey. So I'm curious to hear how that compared with your earlier writing. I started out just to write about enduring faith and perseverance and resilience, just in a general way about finishing well. Uh, I'm, you know, now in the in the last quarter of my life in ministry, so I want to finish well. I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to talk about the things that, uh, from God's word, that have enabled me to keep going and keep growing in my Christian life. So that was. That's really the the topic of the book, and ultimately, that's what the book is about: fresh focus for an enduring faith. And uh, yet, in, as we were ri writing the book, and then COVID hit, uh, and we began to see, of course, the medical pandemic, but with that, a mental health pandemic. And uh, just as a pastor, responding uh, and shepherding our congregation through it, when we were nothing but you know an empty room and online. And, and then when we were gathering people back since the end of May, uh, people were coming back struggling and hurting. And, and I was just seeing all the isolation, all the depression, anxiety, addiction, uh, uh, the uh, domestic abuse. Uh, you can go on and on, uh, just the mental health crisis that we now have in, in, a, in America and among Christians who are struggling, uh, and the struggle is real. So when I really began to think about that, I thought, well, you know, maybe it would be a good time for me to really open up about a battle I had back in 2009 after cancer surgery, uh, a battle that I faced that I never expected, 
uh, with the anxiety and depression following that surgery. And so I spend the first uh, 60 pages of the book really just kind of pouring out my heart on what happened to me and how I was able, by God's grace, uh, to get through uh, that uh, incredibly dark time in my life, frankly. And I do that because it made me a better pastor. It made me a better comforter. I'd never been depressed or anxious to any level and certainly not at any clinical level until this happened. I'd never been sick. I mean, I'm the kind of guy who just, I mean, I've just been going hard all my life and, and loving it, not, not, uh, not wearing myself or burning myself out. But, but then this thing hit and the crisis came and it, it was a struggle. Uh, there were times I felt, I talk about in the book, like a dead man walking. I just couldn't come back from the surgery. And, and some of it was physical, but a lot of it was emotional. And, and so I write here in the book, the very, the very personal and, and I hope spiritual, practical, biblical things that I did in order to reignite. Because uh, my, my flame was a flicker. Uh, for a, a while there, about a year it took to really get through this. And knowing that many people, I mean, mine was episodic, but many people deal with these kinds of issues chronically in their lives. And I, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a biblical counselor in that sense, but I'm a pastoral counselor. And I'm seeing a lot of people who need the message of hope in the midst of all this darkness. And uh, the, whether it's burnout, depression, anxiety, loneliness, separation, uh, that's why I ended up just really opening up. I'm, you know, I wasn't ashamed of the story, but it wasn't something I was just putting out there. I talked to our congregation about it some uh, over the years. It's been 11 years now, but I thought it was time for me to help others with the story that uh, God used in my life. And in the book, you talk about uh, really diving deep into scripture as, as part of your journey, uh, kind of your uh, mm -hmm. a journey through the darkness, if you if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. Who were some of the characters? What were some of the parts of scripture that spoke to you most in that season? Yeah. Well, if you, know, if you had asked me 20, 30 years ago, maybe you came to me and said, uh, you know what, Pastor, I'm, I'm just depressed. I'm down. Uh, I, I wouldn't have been this flippant, but I might have said something like, well, then snap out of it, you know, get yourself going, pray more, read your Bible more, get in church. I mean, which is, that's all good advice, by the way. But the, the one fallacy in that is you can't just snap out of a, of a clinical, severe kind of mental health issue in your life. It takes time. And God used this in my life to, to, to teach me perseverance and endurance and, and to not just go through this, but grow through this. I, I was saying, I think a little bit earlier and stopped. I, I'm a better pastor. I'm a better comforter of people because now I understand if someone tells me I'm struggling, uh, this all came as a result of prostate cancer. Uh, uh, and, and I was okay with, with getting that surgery done and, and really went into the surgery uh, confident. But when I was told maybe we didn't get it all, maybe there's still some cancer there, that flipped me. And the first thing that happened, I began, I wasn't sleeping. I was in the middle of the night, uh, imagining that cancer creeping all over my body. And, and the next thing you know, you know, they torture people with insomnia and sleeplessness. And then once the sleeplessness hit, that which, which was a result of this fear and anxiety, then, then as I understand it, and I, I do know it's true, the Bible says anxiety produces depression because your God put it made us in such a way, if we're revving, 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 stressing, 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 our, our brain and our body slows down. And, and so out of the anxiety comes this slowing down. And with that, I mean, that's a lack of energy. And it, it's, it's what I couldn't, what I couldn't imagine was how I couldn't just get myself going again. How I, how I couldn't, you know, you know, I was, I took some time off. Uh, the summer after my surgery, but when I got back in the pulpit, I was still just kind of dragging myself there. And, and uh, but you know, some wonderful things happened uh, in that time. For example, and one thing that depression does to you, it makes it difficult to concentrate. So preparing sermons during this time was a challenge. So I just pulled some promises from God's word to preach about and promises that were powerful to me, personal to me, things that I was claiming 
passages, promises that I was claiming in all of this. And I would go and preach these. And I was so weak physically and, and, to, and, and also uh, emotionally. I, I can tell you that spiritually, I was doing good. You know, my, my, my prayer life, my, 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 my Bible study, my meditation on scripture, that was all positive. But the physical side, the emotional side, I was still struggling. But anyway, I went up and preached these sermons each week on various promises of God, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, uh, uh, Isaiah 40, 31, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, and uh, Romans 8, 28, these great, you know, so I was just kind of getting through and, and, and thought they were pretty weak sermons, to be honest with you, because I was just getting by. But then later on, we put those same sermons on radio and television. And of course, no one who was listening or watching knew what I was going through at this point. But we had the largest response to any message series uh, to that date that I'd ever done. One, because I I think people sensed a a renewed fire and compassion in me, even though my personal fires were burning low. Uh, And I tell that story just to say, yes. It, it is God's word. And the first point I make in this book is truth for the lies, because ultimately we are what we think as a man thinks in his heart. So is he. And, and the lies that you tell yourself, the lies that Satan tells you in a, in a, in a struggle like this. I mean, one of the lies that I kept hearing was you're finished, you're done. You're stuck like this. But one of the things I kept asking Deb, my wife over and over again, maybe this, this is going to sound familiar to anyone struggling in this area is, am I going to be okay? I must have asked that a hundred times. Am I going to be okay? Because the lies are, are, are about this are very strong. And, and, you know, Deb kept, you know, patiently answering, yes, you're, you're going to get through this. And, and we did. And, you know, and here I am 10, 11 years later, I'm cancer free and, you know, living in joy and enjoying life and ministry is strong, but, uh, it's, it was it was a battle. It was the battle of my life and one I never expected to fight. And in terms of when you shared about your journey publicly, were you surprised by the response of uh, the congregation and others? I, I feel like when we put ourselves out there in a way like this, we're, we're never quite sure how people are going to respond. So how do people respond and what was surprising to you about that? Yeah, I, you know, I, probably 20, 30 years ago in the church, there was a lot of misunderstanding about uh, emotional struggles and mental health, depression in particular, and you wouldn't probably mention it to your Christian friends if you were depressed. Now, that's sad at this point, we know, because we know uh, what, this, what this is in terms of its physical and, and, and brain uh, issue, but you probably wouldn't tell anybody about it because you're, it, you're weak, uh, you, you know, what's wrong with you, it must be sin in your life, or you know, you're, you can't overcome it. And, and so now that there is an, a new openness and pastors like me and others have been, have been discussing this, and uh, this is a real deal for Christians. And just because uh, you're a Christian doesn't mean you're immune uh, to these issues. And so you asked me earlier about the Bible. Uh, you, you read your Bible and you discover that Moses was one was so depressed and so stressed that one day he prayed to die. And same thing happened to uh, Jonah after he'd been preaching in Nineveh, and he was angry that all those bad Ninevites were uh, repenting and, and revival had come. And he was arguing with God, and he said, fine, just take my life. And then the big example in the Old Testament uh, is, is Elijah, who, who had this great victory on Mount Carmel, fire fell, the power of God was displayed, the prophets of Baal, and yet he ran uh, into the desert, frightened by Jezebel's threats, and got under a tree in the desert and said, "Lord, it's enough. Just, just take my life right now." So there are three very powerful biblical personalities that uh, experience this. David, read the Psalms. So often, David uh, was was crying out to God with tears uh, because he was suffering emotionally and and spiritually as well. Uh, Apostle Paul, greatest Christian who ever lived, in my estimation, once said, I despaired of life itself. So when you really study your Bible, you realize that this is common to all of us. Depression, if you're just talking about that piece of, of, uh, 
of a mental health issues. I mean, that's called the common cold of, of, of mental health. And more and more people are subject to it. It's some of it's our lifestyle, the pressure, the stress, anxiety people are living under. And it ultimately becomes the truth that conquers the lies that you tell yourself, that Satan tells you that you can't recover, you're not going to reignite, you're never going to get there, uh, or that life's never going to be the same. And uh, But I'm here to tell you, and this is what we talk about in the book, it can be better. And you're your life can be um, filled again. I remember uh, when I was, I was talking to my doctor and I said, why can't I get going? What's wrong with me? What's, you know, uh, because I've always exercised and I was running. I, I did maintain exercise, which is very important, by the way, if you're struggling in this area to keep at least walking this one foot in front of another. But I remember saying, why can't I? And he held up a water bottle that was half empty or half full as it were. And he said, most people get up every day and their water bottle's full. You got a full bottle of energy for every day. And that's the way you've been all your life. But now you're getting up looking like this. And it was a half bottle, which, you know, that's the way, you know, that helped me to see. And he said, it's just going to take time for your bottle to fill up again, for the energy to come back again. And it does. And, and I can't explain it, but it's almost like a storm rolls in. And you know how you can't shout at the storm and make it go. You can't shake your fist. You can't pray it away. The storm, I'm talking about a physical storm now, it, it just goes. And, and, and these kind of, for me, this is kind of what happened. And it just kind of rolled away. I had a good friend um, by the name of O.S. Hawkins. We've been lifelong friends. He said a simple thing to me one day. In fact, it was, I will never forget it, it was after a sermon. Uh, Sunday morning sermons that I was so tired and exhausted after it was done. And I said, Oh, it's, I mean, I don't know. I'm not coming back. Like I, I thought I would. And he said, remember Jack, there's never been a sunset that there hasn't been a sunrise. And that's a simple thought, but it's a powerful truth. And the Bible says uh, morning endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And to anyone who's listening to this right now, I can just say, be patient, persevere, stay in God's word, meditating on God's word, certainly pray. Uh, I, I practice the therapy of thanksgiving. You know, giving thanks is, is the most powerful antidote to negative human emotions that are toxic. I did therapy. I talked to a counselor. And I took some medication to get myself going again. And that's been debated among Christians. Uh, but I talk about the reason for that, why I went ahead and did that. And that was one thing I didn't want to talk about necessarily because say, well, the pastor had to have a, a medication to help, you know, get through this. Well, yes. And, you know, I take medications for other things too. I, if I get a headache, I take medication and depression, anxiety, these things, and you have to be careful with medication and, and, and it can be abused. But I talk in the, in this first chapter of why I chose to uh, and I'm not on a medication at this point, but I certainly would encourage Christians to see a professional. And I talk about therapy as as a part of the healing uh, in our lives when when we go through something like this. And a lot of times when we go through difficult seasons, it'll cause us to focus on what really matters in life. Um, what did you learn about really beginning to see or maybe see in a new light what was most important? <clears throat> well, you know, the calling of God upon my life was, you know, just renewed in this. And when something typically, and as I was saying earlier, I was thinking, okay, maybe it's gone, maybe it's maybe it's over. And then when when you recover, when you're healed, when you know you're celebrating, and and you you realize that uh, how vital, how important your calling is in life. And to be able to get back to my calling and see in the last 10 or 11 years, just really the greatest days of my ministry. And I do think in many ways, that's because people, whether they know what I've been through or not, they sense something different in me. They sense something new. I've had people say that, what, what is that, you know, uh, that's going on with you? And I, I do think I, I preach with a greater compassion and passion and, and love, if you will. Uh, and understanding uh, towards people, because when you're preaching to a congregation any size, you've got hurting people there. 
And, and I always cared about hurting people. I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a shepherd of a church. But this just heightened, you know, that understanding and clarified for me uh, how I could best help people. Like, for example, even with prostate cancer, now I bet I, bet I get two or three calls a month from men who and so many men are getting and men, you ought to always go get your PSA check and save your life. But I get those calls now and I, I understand. And I say, Hey, you, you know, be prepared, pray up, get ready because it, it sounds like an easy deal, but it is cancer. And it is in my case, surgery in other cases, uh, treatments of various kinds, but it's a challenge. It's a mental battle more than it is a physical battle. So now I'm able to, as the Bible says, God is the God of all comfort. And with the comfort that we are comforted, we then comfort others. So that to me is, uh, is, is, the, is the best thing that happened out of that, uh, out of this experience. And it taught me to depend upon God like never before. And uh, I guess the last thing I would, I would ask would be uh, in terms of legacy, like what, how, how has legacy been a focus of the years since? I always believe that you shouldn't concentrate so much on uh, leaving a legacy because you're going to do that one way or another, but living a legacy. That's good. Because if you, if you live for Christ and to honor him and to fulfill his purpose and calling in your life and with your family and obviously with your priorities and the, th- the way you live your life, that's what you leave behind for the generations behind. Uh, you know, my children are grown. They have children. So my focus now is on being the best father and grandfather that I can be and, 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 to, and to live for Christ and let the legacy take care of, of itself. And so a lot of people are too concerned about what I'm going to leave instead of what I'm gonna, how I'm going to live. So let's focus on how we live in Christ and let God take care of what's left behind. And Jack, in terms of the reader's journey with the book, uh, when they get to that last page, close that back flap, like what's that core takeaway, that core message you want every single reader to have discovered in the book? That it's worth it to, to follow Jesus, that, that faith. I, I was just preaching on faith in Abraham's life this past Sunday, and I'm doing a series in Romans on the essential gospel. And when you get to that fourth chapter and it's all about Abraham and justification, but it's also about how his faith, even in old age was, was strengthened and you can have an old body, but a young faith. And, and that was Abraham. And so I was saying in that message, you know, what's the one thing that God uh, expects from us that God uh, requires of us. And That's clear what that is. It's a simple thing. It's faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. So to please God, it's not my works, my efforts. It's just that one thing, that that simple faith to believe God. And I can tell you after all these years of trekking with the Lord, that I believe more now than ever, even through this experience. It didn't didn't destroy my faith. It strengthened my faith. And adversity— if given to Christ, will produce ultimate stability in, in Christ. But it is, it is his ability, God's ability, that gives our faith stability when the winds are blowing and everything's turned upside down. And that's really what this book is about. Yes, there's my story here, and I, I hope it's helpful, but it's really about how to endure, how to enjoy your life and experience the fullness of God and then go to heaven uh, and experience his victory forever. And Jack, uh, almost time for us to go. But before we wrap up, I'd love for you to take a few moments to pray for, encourage the listeners and viewers, however you feel led. Would you do that for us? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, if, if you are burning low or burning out, if you are struggling in some way in your life right now, uh, know that God cares. Know that his presence, he never abandons us. He never forsakes us. He's real. And I, when you go to the bottom, and I don't know if I was at the bottom, but for me, it was all the way to the bottom. And if, you're, if you feel like it's dark and you're at the bottom, he's there and faith is enough. When you find in your life that 
uh, Jesus is all you have, you'll discover that he's all you need. And I would just, I would just say to everyone who's listening to this right now, and especially someone who may be hurting in some way, you're coming out of this COVID experience. You've been locked down, shut down, isolated from family, from friends, maybe even from church. Uh, I would just tell you that, uh, God has a plan. God has a purpose. As my good friend said to me, there's never been a sunset that there's not a sunrise. And the light is going to break forth as the dawn in your life. And you're going to fill up again. And, and that energy is going to come back and your life's going to come back. And there's just one thing you need to do, as we were saying, and that is believe God. Just hang on to that one thing in faith and faith. Believe God, and you'll see God work in ways that you could never have imagined before. Well, that is an, an encouragement that deserves an amen. Thank you so much for that. And Jack, for the listeners, the viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about this book, your ministry, where can we no. discover you on the web? JackGraham.org. JackGraham.org. J-A-C-K-G-R-A-H-A-M.org. And um, the, all my resources are there. How to get the book is there about our church, about our ministry, all things uh, related, uh, jackgram.org. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Jack and pick, uh, pick up your very own copy of his new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Jack Graham. Once again, our book today was Reignite, Fresh Focus for an Enduring Faith. If you'd like to find out more, head over to Jack's website. You can find that at jackgram.org. And Jack, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Sean. My pleasure.